Right. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, uh, welcome to this uh, public event run by the uh, School of Public Policy at the LSC and the International Inequalities Institute. Thank you very much for coming in an, at an, in an evening when there are many other attractions that might have distracted you, like a certain football game. Mm -hmm. It's great that you're here. Um, this event is part of LSE's Understanding the UK Economy series, um, which showcases research and expertise on the state of the UK economy and its future. I am uh, Francisco Ferreira, the Amartya Sen Professor of Inequality Studies at the LSE. And uh, it's, it's uh, a pleasure for me to, to, to chair this and welcome uh, my LSE colleagues, Professor Jonathan Hopkin, uh, Andy Summers and Kate Summers to this to this panel, which marks the the launch of and discusses the new issue of the LSE Public Policy Review, uh, our own in-house journal. Uh, this issue is called Beverage 2.0: Tax Justice, which is the topic of today's seminar. The link to the issue can be found on the event page, or you can just Google LSE Public Policy Review. Um, if you're attending on Zoom, the link to the issue has been posted on the Zoom chat. Uh, you know, as usual, if you could please put your phones on silent so as not to disrupt the event, please note the event is being recorded and will hopefully be made available as a podcast if there are no technical issues. And of course, at the end, there'll be a chance for a Q&A. Each of our speakers will speak for about uh, uh, 10 to 15 minutes, um, and then we'll have time at the end for a discussion. Um, we will be joined, we're told, by James Murray, MP, um, but his office has said he's a little bit late. So we'll start and hopefully he'll, he'll join us. There's a seat for him over there. So uh, let me introduce the panel then very briefly. So in the order in which they'll speak. So Kate Summers, Dr. Kate Summers is a British Academy postdoctoral fellow in the Department of Methodology at the LSE. Professor Jonathan Hopkin, next to her, is Professor of Comparative Politics in the Department of Government at LSE and also at the European Institute. And uh, Andy Summers is Associate Professor of Law at the LSE Law School. Um, when James Murray joins us, uh, he is the Labor and Cooperative MP for Ealing North and he's also a shadow financial secretary to the treasury. Uh, so without further ado, let me hand over to Kate. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, thanks very much uh, for being here this evening. Um, I won't try and make a joke about football, but it's very nice to see people here and online as well. Um, so um, what I'm going to do first is sort of set the scene with a focus on the UK, but thinking in a relatively big, big picture way about approaches to taxing wealth and why different approaches might be more or less popular uh, taking a sociological perspective. Um, so I'm drawing on the paper that's in the um, issue um, that Chico just introduced uh, that I wrote with Katerina Hecht and Mike Savage. Um, so it's very much joint work and joint thinking with them. Um, and what we do in the article and what I want to talk about today briefly is reflect on why it might be difficult to garner public support for taxing wealth. And what I'm specifically doing is taking a, yeah, a sociological perspective and drawing on, on recent research that others and myself um, have been uh, involved in. Um, so to start, what I want to show you are um, two ways in which um, approaches to taxation and ways of sort of presenting and talking about wealth tend to be presented in media and public discourse. And I was gonna emphasize, this is not current Labour Party policy, which would have been more important if James Murray was here. That in, so this is an example from in 2019, 
uh, during the general election campaign, something that the Labour Party announced was that it was going to reduce uh, the uh, change the threshold at which the highest rate of income tax was applied down to £80,000 a year. Um, and you can see this is, uh, so the man on the right there uh, was the shadow chancellor at the time, and he's on a, a kind of flagship BBC politics programme, and he's defending this idea and talking about how it would only be those uh, in the top 1% who would see the highest increase and only the top 5% of earners would face this rise. And um, it gave way to this big uh, media discussion about whether £80,000 a year really constituted being rich, whether that made you wealthy, if that was your income level. Um, and this first example I'm showing you, because uh, one of the two main ways that we often see taxation and wealth, what I'm going to show you in a second, talked about in media and public discourse is what you might call distributional or framings around levels. Um, and so here you see the emphasis is on the specific threshold, the percentages of who would be implicated within that threshold. And what I want to show you is that that's really quite meaningless and isn't how a lot of people think about taxation, and I'm going to go on to talk about taxation of wealth in their own lives. And secondly, thinking more specifically about wealth, these are just some uh, screen grabs of recent articles in kind of centre or centre left um, news outlets discussing uh, different policies around tax and wealth tax. Um, these, seem, these tend to be the sorts of pictures you might see accompanying these sorts of stories when it's talking about taxation of wealth. So you've got kind of pictures of supercars. This is a man looking in an expensive watch shop window. Um, so this, there's this other sort of mainstream discourse and presentation of kind of luxury goods and very, very high end sort of consumer um, things being associated with what it looks like to be wealthy. Um, and against these, what we try and do in the article and what I'm going to show you now is to develop a finer grained account of how wealth is talked about and experienced in ordinary everyday life and show you that it actually doesn't really look like either of these things. Um, and that actually by understanding that, understanding what wealth means and how it's experienced uh, for most people, that might give us some insights for how we could go about thinking about uh, more progressive taxation of wealth. So drawing on existing research um, that we then put together in the paper, we want to make the point that there are two main kind of facets to how people, and this is drawing on predominantly UK-based research um, and for the things that I've been involved in, actually kind of often London-based research. There are two main facets to this that in the ways in which people talk about wealth in their own lives. One is to do with relational factors, so family, and the other temporal factors, so the future, and that these intertwine. And I'm going to show you a couple of quotes. Um, so in terms of future, when you actually look at the um, discourses and ways that people talk about wealth, wealth is related to the prospect of stability into the future, of things like the chance of living a good life, and kind of more tangibly, that might mean things like building up a pension pot, buying your own house, things like this. And so this is um, from work that uh, me and Katerina Hecht have done before. So the top left hand quote, uh, you can see lots of stuff on the screen there. It's not very helpful. Um, is uh, from someone who we call Tom, who is a top 1% earner working in the city of London. Um, and he's asked about what wealth, being wealthy means to him. Is there a way I can kind of hide this a little bit, you know, or is it alt? Okay, I'll just read it. Um, so for me, so Tom says, for me being wealthy, it just enables us as a family to build our asset base further, to make sure that the next generation and the one beyond are going to be comfortable. Financial security in a general sense, not having enough just to live, but live the lifestyle the way you want to lead it for us as a family. That means making sure our children and grandchildren are well looked after. So you can see it's about, uh, for Tom, making sure into the future. And actually, I think it's notable as someone who is right at the top of the income and wealth distribution, it's not just his own children, but his grandchildren, he's sort of thinking about um, that he can secure that future for them. But this isn't just something we see kind of at the top end of the 
distribution. So this is an extract from an interview uh, of someone I spoke to uh, called Turner, who at the time was unemployed and he had um, a history of different sorts of manual occupations. Um, he lives in Newham in East London. And he was talking about kind of the point or kind of a main drive of why you would really prioritize getting back to work and earning is so you can get more money, you can save money, because at the end of the day, really, when you're working, it's about working and saving, about working and saving for the future for your children. You know, saving is very essential in life when you're working. And then he talks about sort of when you've not got enough money, it's just going out the door, you're back to square one again, back to square one again. You have to do a lot of backing up, catching up when you can't meet the things, you can't meet things in demand. And so it's notable that it's across the income and wealth distributions that we see this um, intertwining of the importance of security into the future and expressing and sort of cementing family bonds and relationships that's really at the center. And I think the implication of insights like this is that wealth is not, um, as maybe on different parts of the political spectrum, you might kind of see it presented, wealth is not de facto a bad thing for people in their everyday lives. In fact, it's a very good thing for lots of people in their everyday lives. Um, and policy and sort of policy, especially on the left, needs to be sort of aware of this and tread carefully given this. So just to finish up but I want to say and clarify things a little bit further I want to just show you some extracts from another project um, that uh, myself and uh, Katerina and then others at uh, both the Inequalities Institute and CASE at LSE have been involved in that involve focus groups with members of the public to think about whether there was a point at which we might identify members of the public might identify uh, riches line so a point that there's kind of too much um, for, for some reason. Uh, so it was a kind of open-ended focus group design. We were asking people to deliberate around what riches and what kind of excessive riches might look like. Um, this was based in London. And what happened was that uh, members of the public were really very reluctant to identify a point at which kind of that, that point would be too much, whether it was kind of an, an amount of income or wealth or sort of what you did with your income or wealth. Um, so you can see, for example, in the top left, someone talking about it's important that you have the super rich as a category because they have to be goals in life. But you should have the scope to go there kind of if you want to. So you see these kind of playing out of um, aspirational and meritocratic discourses that we know from other work as well is uh, very common in, in countries like the UK. Um, and then we also see if you look at the bottom left and the top right, um, what came through again and again in the focus groups was the importance that for people talking about that they, if the rich had worked for and earned, or if they'd got their money legitimately and were entitled to it, then why shouldn't they keep it, however high that is? And kind of lastly, so, so there that's something about sort of fair process justifying the outcome however high potentially that outcome is, as long as kind of you come about your, your riches or your wealth fairly, then that's okay. Um, and lastly, just a short quote of someone talking about um, the queen who was alive when we did these focus groups. Um, there was a striking degree of kind of empathy and identification with the very wealthy. So you've got somewhere, someone here saying, well, the Queen's kind of always had a lot of land and stuff, so it'd be quite hard for her to know that it was too much. So we really should kind of empathise with that and understand where people like the Queen are coming from. And so also this overlay that there was um, actually counter to a lot of work thinking about how poverty is thought about and people who are experiencing poverty are talked about. There was a lot more empathy for the rich and the very rich in terms of kind of the understanding of their situation. So what does that mean for policy? I think then what's really important to take away from that is not to talk about levels of wealth or what at the beginning I call this like distributional framing of wealth, but to think potentially about sources of wealth that are seen as unfair or exclusionary. So wealth that's maybe gained through uh, extraction or types of landlordism or cheating the system in some way. Um, and that might be a more fruitful way forward for talking about and engaging with kind of more progressive policy options around taxation of wealth. Um, the very last thing I'll say before ending is I think setting this within the current context, I think and maybe something to bring back, come back to in the discussion, 
there's some sort of two maybe main uh, forces that are in tension. One being the current cost of living crisis potentially gives us a time that really radicalizes the options on the table because of the shared experience that many people will have. Um, but at the same time, an argument we make in the article is that in a context, in a country like the UK where you have ongoing austerity, the role of private wealth and the need to secure, make security for yourself becomes kind of even more heightened if you can't rely on the state to be doing those things for you. So it might be the case then that actually kind of the need to accumulate privately and protect you and your family privately becomes kind of even more important and, and actually legitimates keeping, like not thinking that you need more distributive policies. I'll end there, thanks very much. Thanks very much, Kate. Over to Jonathan. Okay, thank you. Okay, so um, I'm just going to present a few um, short short points, really, that come out of the paper I wrote for this for this special issue. And in a way, looking at the audience, I'm probably you aren't the people this is directed at, um, because being a lot of you students from LSE from an international kind of background. I mean, a lot of what I was trying to say is is thinking about the way in which. Uh, we talk about tax in the UK, and really one of the reasons I, I first got interested in the politics of redistribution and, and, and taxation and government spending is because, you know, growing up in Britain, observing our politics in the 1980s, a lot of it seemed to revolve around, do you, do you want a penny more on your income tax for some more NHS spending, or do you want a tax cut so you can spend your own money the, the way you want. And Margaret Thatcher would come out with these phrases, uh, you know, the problem with socialism is they always run out of other people's money and so on. So this seemed to be, you know, a very central framing of British politics at that time. In some ways, it still is a little bit less. But then I, I, I went as part of my my um, my uh, undergrad education, I went to, the, to Spain, I went to France, and I had started to observe how politics didn't really work that way in those countries, that actually elections weren't fought necessarily around you know very specific um, tax policies and these kind of household calculations of how much it's going to cost you to vote for a, a a different kind of party so this is what got me interested in how different countries frame the way in which we talk about tax and um, one of the outcomes of, of these different framings is that countries have different uh, different levels of taxation they tax in different ways and uh, and the overall volume of, of tax revenue allows governments to, to do different things. So what I, I'm, I have a couple of slides, I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of these variations, but just to give you a bit of background as to where, where I'm coming from, from. And I think even now we have these excellent uh, reports on fiscal issues in, in, in Britain. We have the IFS, we have the Resolution Foundation, we have lots of, of, of think tanks and, and people doing really, really good work explaining what the implications of different tax policies might be uh, for the UK economy and for UK households. But very often what is lacking, I think, in the British political debate is this comparison with other places where we can get to a situation where even though the uh, percentage of UK GDP, which is taken in tax revenue by the government has now hit, hit one of its highest levels since I think the 1970s, I think. Um, and, and this is seen as being somehow this onerous burden on, on British people. But of course, if we look at other countries, most other rich uh, democracies with the big exception being the United States, of course, actually tax quite a lot more and as a result have more resources available to do uh, to to generate public goods to provide social protection and and so on so uh oh here i go what do i need to do click here we go right so um so this is just you know a, a nice little uh chart with levels of tax revenues a share of gdp for a bunch of OECD countries. And, um, and what I also have in, in this chart is not only the current levels, but also levels in, in the mid 1960s. So I have, a, I, and what I'm trying to capture here is what's really happened over the last uh, little bit more than half a century 
in terms of tax revenues in, in, in rich democratic countries, most of them, most of them in, in Europe. So the, the, the height of the, of the column is the, the percentage. Now, if you uh, uh, take away the orange part of the, of the column, that is the difference, the growth in tax revenue, and it is growth for all countries except Ireland uh, since 1965. And you know, those of you who've looked at comparative uh, uh, fiscal politics, comparative welfare politics, will not be surprised to see that you know countries like Denmark and France and Sweden uh, up up there with the highest levels of tax revenues that show GDP getting out and getting on for half of GDP uh, in tax revenue and government spending usually a little bit more than that. And so these are countries which have where the government has around half of GDP uh, available for. A variety of public policies. Uh, if we go all the way down to, to the left-hand side of the chart, you see countries where the tax take is smaller. Ireland is the weirdest case, but of course, Ireland is a little bit exceptional for a variety of reasons. Um, but one of them, of course, being it's really dramatically fast GDP growth over the last 30 years, which means that actually Ireland has not really needed to uh, expand its tax revenue as a shared GDP all, all that much to keep pace with the demands of the population for public policies, although there are a lot of complaints in Ireland about various things that the government fails to do. Um, so you can see there's a kind of bunching of um, small Northern European um, um, welfare states up there at the high end. Uh, so a lot of the Anglo-Saxon countries are at the lower end, and you can see the UK is, is in the bottom third or so. So of course, Britain is not a highly taxed country by international standards. And, and this is, of course, something that I tell all my conservative voting relatives all the time, <laughs> that actually we should be taxed more. But of course, it's a very difficult thing for politicians to, uh, to stand up and say, and we'll see in a little while, perhaps, uh, whether um, the, the Labour Party is, is able to say that we should be taxed more. But historically, that is seen as being the kind of third rail of British politics. You can't come along and say, we need to pay more tax for all these nice things we want. Um, and I think just another point I'd like to note here is if you look at the UK, the orange section of the column is really quite small. So the share of GDP taken in, in, in tax uh, now in the UK is not that much higher than it was in the 1960s. But in the 1960s, most countries took much less tax revenues as a share of GDP, GDP than, they, than they do now. So what you can see there is really the divergence in tax politics between uh, the UK and most other Western European countries, which have all expanded the uh, resources available to the governments in, in, in this half century or so. So I, I, I think tax revenue peaked in the mid 1970s in the UK, and of course the Thatcher revolution and uh, the reluctance of the Labour Party to contest that kind of low tax settlement in, in the 90s and 2000s has, has left us um, in the bottom part of that table. So what that tells us, of course, is that when we look in, at Britain and the state we're in, uh, quite high levels of poverty, a lot of people struggling to make ends meet, and a very visible decline in public services and public goods, it's kind of obvious, uh, looking at this chart, what the answer might be, right, is that we need to raise the resources to deal with that. And although we don't have economic growth, of course, which is a big problem, you can't really claim that British households couldn't afford to pay more tax on average. Um, now, this is all really important from the point of view of thinking about inequality, because um, the level of tax revenue is very closely related to uh, the amount uh, governments are able to um, limit inequality in income. So what this uh, slightly more complicated chart shows, it's a scatter plot of on the, one, on the x axis here, you have tax revenue as a share of GDP, so that's the same data I just showed you. And on the y-axis, we have Gini coefficient reduction, um, which is basically Gini coefficient's typical measure of inequality. I'm sure many of you are aware of, 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 of how it's calculated. It's an, it's an overall uh, summary measure of inequality. But we're talking about the reduction in the Gini coefficient comparing pre-tax incomes and post-tax incomes. Now, all countries uh, manage to uh, reduce Gini coefficient somewhat after government taxation and spending is taken to, into account, but some of them do this much more than others. And what you can see is actually it's very, very tightly correlated. Uh, so levels of tax revenue explain about two thirds of the reduction in the, of the variation 
of reduction in Gini coefficients across OECD countries. And you can see that you know, countries which are high spenders, Finland, France, Denmark up the top, really reduce uh, the Gini coefficients a lot. Um, and so, you know, if we want to do anything about inequality, there's no real, empirically, there seems to be no uh, indication here that we can do that without significant amounts of money raised uh, by government in, in taxation. You can see at the bottom end, of course, lower levels of government uh, tax uh, uh, correspond to lower levels of, uh, of Gini coefficient reduction. Britain, you can see, is right in the middle there. Uh, in, it, it's, on, it's on the regression line. So we can, we're, in Britain, you get the amount of inequality reduction that you would expect for that level of tax revenue. But you know, it seems that probably <laughs> it's a, it's a very simple model, of course, just two variables. But you know, probably raising tax revenue, assuming the government did the kind of things governments usually do with more tax revenues, would reduce inequality more. And because Britain has relatively high inequality, remember this is inequality reduction, not inequality itself. Um, Britain has pretty high inequality, and doing anything about that without significantly raising tax revenue is probably going to be quite difficult. So, uh, you know, how do we do this? Well, this is the tricky part, right? And this is the ugliest chart I have to offer today, which is thinking about, and these are average, um, average shares of GDP um, taken in different kinds of taxation by OECD countries. So it's averaged across the whole of the OECD. Again, the same period, 1965 to um, I'll see what I think it's sometime in uh, um, 2019, I think the data came up to. Um, so here the trends are not really so stark, but what you can see is that tax revenues went up and then they kind of fell back a little bit at the end of the 1980s, but then you know, recovered and essentially ever since really the mid 1980s, shares of tax revenue have been broadly similar on average, but what you can see is subtle changes in the types of tax that are being raised. And really very strikingly, um, the, the, the bottom area, which uh, is um, the uh, income tax pay, has actually you know, remained roughly constant whilst overall tax revenues have grown. So the, the actual share uh, taken in um, in income tax as a proportion of total tax revenues has declined. Now, this is a bit of a problem because income tax is one of the most progressive forms of taxation, assuming that is that governments are able to levy those taxes uh, fairly and efficiently. And so that means there's less scope for the tax revenues we raise to actually take resources from the more privileged parts of society and redistribute them to the poorer. Um, what's also quite striking is that making up for that, there's been an increase in what we can broadly call social security and payroll uh, taxes. Um, and these are things like in the UK, we have national insurance, which isn't really a, isn't really an, a social security tax in, in that way. But these are contributions taken out of employee, um, employee salaries to pay for um, social insurance, social protection. So to pay for pensions, or sometimes healthcare, and, uh, and uh, unemployment insurance and so on, and typically in the corporatist welfare states that we see in Western Europe. And that share has gone up, right? And the important thing here is that these tend to be more regressive forms of taxation. Uh, so then, you know, workers on average to lower salaries are paying disproportionately high shares of their income and that kind of thing. So, uh, so what you're seeing is taxation going, getting less progressive. Who is really benefiting from this? Well, people, of course, on higher incomes, but also people who are making money in other ways, right? So you can see that the share of corporate tax, which is this yellow band, has gone up a bit. But of course, if we look at the share of uh, the um, economy taken uh, by capital as returns on investments compared to the labor share of income, that has been going up consistently since the 1970s. So the fact that capital taxation has not gone up all that much suggests that probably we're missing a trick here, that there is a potential untapped largely potential to tax uh, capital income more. Um, and this is something that governments are, are so far showing some reluctance to do.
So that tells a bit of a story. I mean, the one part of this story is that tax revenues, despite what we could broadly call the sort of, the sort of neoliberal turn of the 1980s and 1990s, has continued to be quite high across OECD countries. So the, the ambitions of Thatcher and Reagan and others to actually cut the size of the state back, roll back the frontiers of the state, as Margaret Thatcher used to call it, haven't really been realized. They've not managed to actually uh, pare back tax revenues. And there are good reasons for that. Voters quite like having the things that taxes pay for. And it, it is very unpopular to cut back popular uh, forms of, of social spending. And therefore, if you're not going to borrow the difference, which is, of course, also increasingly diff difficult for some countries, uh, then you're going to have to raise some of that income in, in tax. So, but what has happened is that given a certain level of tax revenues, we've seen a shift in who is paying uh, those revenues. And of course, this has a couple of consequences. One, of course, is that it's a bit unfair and it makes um, the distribution of resources more unequal because all else equal, if richer people are paying comparatively less than they were before, that means that poorer people are going to have to pay more and they're the ones who have a big investment in the kinds of things that tax revenue generally pays for things like health spending, pensions, welfare benefits, and so on. But the other side of it is that it acts as a break on the growth of government. Because if you can ensure that the beneficiaries of public spending end up having to pay for it, and those are the ones who have the least ability to generate high incomes in the market economy, then that acts as a kind of natural constraint on the growth of, of government spending. In other words, if you say to people, you can have your welfare benefits, but those who really need them are going to have to pay for them, then this is going to act to contain the demand for, for, uh, for redistribution and for public goods more broadly. So uh, this is the kind of you know, comparative and over time context that I talk about in the paper. Um, probably what I, I would say to conclude is a couple of things. First of all, that Countries talk about tax in different ways. And this is where I started. I was really struck by how in, in different countries, the conversation about tax is a different one. In Britain, we talk about a penny on income tax. To do this would cost 7p on the rate of income tax, a very common way of framing decisions about public policy in the UK. But in many of the countries that I've studied, um, particularly in Southern Europe, this is not the conversation they have uh, uh, at all. Just before coming here, I was just checking on, on Twitter and I saw the Italian government has passed its budget. And one of the most contentious issues in the Italian budget was at what threshold does a shopkeeper have to allow you uh, to pay with a contactless card? What on earth has that got to do with tax? Well, because in Italy, tax politics has often revolved around differential opportunities for tax evasion. And small businesses and small shops in particular have historically been very successful at evading tax in a variety of ways, uh, mainly by taking the, the, their, uh, their takings in, in cash rather than electronically. And the Italian state, on the other hand, is pushing back, desperately trying to get as much electronic uh, and track transactions as possible so that they can track what's going on and make sure that these taxes are being paid. So I thought, you know, this is a very curious little example of how tax politics plays out in different ways in different places. And uh, although many of the issues facing governments when it comes to deciding how much to tax and who to tax are, are very similar across these rich democracies, there are really fascinating differences often, you know, derived from different histories, uh, which make that conversation, you know, curiously diverse and you know, make it all the more difficult to understand exactly how it is that you get to this high tax equilibrium rather than a lower tax equilibrium. But you know, I hope we can have a conversation about how to shift that because my conclusion would be the only way this country gets to be a civilized and successful society is by making us all pay more tax. Thanks. Thanks very much, uh, Jonathan. Uh, I think we've been joined by, by Mr. Morris. I'm delighted to uh, welcome him to the podium here. Uh, and also I will um, remind him as I've reminded others before that we have an online audience and the event's being recorded and all that. We're delighted that you could join us. Thanks, thanks very much. So over to Andy, thanks.
So uh, my paper for the special issue was on this topic of whether it's possible to tax the super rich. And that question is prompted by several high profile anecdotes that many of you will be aware of, that some very rich people paying very low effective rates of tax. And on the one hand, this can be seen as a powerful motivator for reforming the tax system. But some people see it almost as a council of despair, this idea that sort of whatever we do, the very rich will always find ways around um, paying. My take in the paper is that we don't need to be quite that pessimistic, um, that it is possible to tax the super rich more if you know where the weak points in the current system are. So today I want to focus on one particular example that I look at in the paper, which draws on uh, recent empirical work I've undertaken with um, several co-authors. Um, and it's one that's been in the news quite a lot recently. Um, it's the non-DOM tax status. So I'd better start just by saying briefly um, what a non-DOM is. Uh, because this is an issue that I found confuses quite a lot of people, even people who know quite a lot generally um, about the tax system. So a non-DOM is a person who lives in the UK. They can actually spend all of the year in the UK. They might have lived in the UK um, for several years. But what enables them to claim this special tax status is that um, they can claim that their permanent home, or in other words, their domicile, is abroad. So these are people who live in the UK, but have ties to somewhere else. And claiming non-DOM status for, for tax purposes um, means that you can effectively, um, this isn't quite how the, uh, how the legislation works formally, but in effect, um, if you're claiming non-DOM status, you can um, avoid paying tax on any of your foreign income and gains while you're alive, uh, and also uh, any of your foreign assets when you die. Um, so this is quite a um, appealing regime for those who are both have these international ties and have the amount of wealth held abroad that makes it worthwhile um, they're claiming this status. And there's lots of high profile um, examples of individuals who have um, admitted claiming non-DOM status, either currently um, or in the past. Some of them uh, are shown here uh, on the slide and are people that, that you probably all recognize. I'm not gonna say any more about individual cases, but what really matters for policy purposes is what's going on in this non-DOM population as a whole. Are these kind of anecdotes, you know, to what extent are they representative of a, of a broader set of issues? So this is where the work that, um, that I've done with co-authors comes in. We looked at using uh, access to confidential tax records via HMRC. We looked at the tax records of everyone who's claimed non-DOM status at any point over the past two decades. Um, and first thing that we can do using those data is to look at where they sit within the rest of the UK population. And so what this is showing you uh, on, on the slide is the share of individuals who have claimed non-DOM status either currently, so that's in the, the dark blue bar, or uh, additionally at some point during this period um, in the, the additional green bar on top, according to the amount of UK income that they report. And I'll, I'll return to that point about UK income in a moment. But even just looking at um, how non-DOM status varies by people's UK income, you can see a very steep gradient here. So amongst people, the 99% or so of the population who are reporting incomes of less than £100,000, non-DOM status is not a particularly important phenomenon, about 0.3% of those sort of regular people, if you like, have ever claimed non-DOM status. So first of all, if you were thinking that this is a regime that sort of everyone who arrives in the UK claims when they arrive, then that's not how it works. And the simple reason for that is that there are certain costs to claiming non-DOM status. Um, and so it's only worth your while if you're if you have ties to abroad and you have sufficient assets abroad um, to make it worth claiming. 
But then as we go up the income distribution, we can see that the propensity of claiming non-DOM status rises very, very sharply. By the time we get to the people that um, we might sort of colloquially label the super rich, those individuals with you know, more than 5 million in annual income, the share of those people who are claiming non-DOM status or have claimed it in the past is about four in every 10. So non-DOM status is actually a kind of first order issue when you're thinking about taxes on the super rich. Approaching half of that group have made use of this tax break at some point. So you might recall those of you who've been sort of thinking about these issues for a while, some reforms, there've been lots of reforms to um, the non-DOM regime, sort of I was calling them tinkering reforms over the past um, 15 years or so. The most recent of which was uh, a set of reforms that took effect in 2017. They were announced just after the um, conservative government um, under David Cameron and George Osborne um, took office in, in 2015. And there, George Osborne acknowledges the, perce the perception of unfairness of this regime. He says, it's, and this is a, a quote from the budget speech. He says, it's not fair that people live in this country for very long periods of their lives, benefit from our public services, and yet operate under different tax rules from everyone else. Non-DOM status was meant to be temporary, but it became permanent for some people, not any longer. And then he says, and this Keep this in mind for the next slide. I am today abolishing non -dom, permanent non-DOM status. Anyone resident in the UK for more than 15 of the past 20 years will now pay full British taxes on all worldwide income and gains. And then the rhetoric at the end, British people should pay British taxes in Britain, and now they will. Except, did they really? So at the same time as the budget speech, um, was announced, technical guidance was issued by HMRC. This is like reading the small print in the contract. It says non-DOMs who have set up an offshore trust before they become deemed domiciled under the 15 year rule will not be taxed on trust income and gains that are retained in the trust and such excluded property trusts will have the same inheritance tax treatment as present. And what that means in sort of layman's terms is so long as you put your assets into a trust before you're deemed domicile, before this reform kicks in, then you can carry on pretty much not paying UK tax. There are some additional restrictions, conditions. It's not quite as good as the regime you had before, but you're definitely not paying tax on the same basis as everybody else. So, um, what could we do about this? Well, I think something that holds, holds people back and is a prominent feature of this debate is the worry that, well, if we really tax these people properly, if we really tax them on the same basis as everybody else, then they would just leave the UK. And so another part of our research looks directly at this question. Uh, and we find on the one hand that non-DOMs are a highly mobile group. About 10% of um, those individuals affected by the reform that I mentioned, even before the reform, about 10% of them leave every year. So it's a group which is indeed internationally mobile, but that's not quite the question that we need to ask as, as tax policymakers. The question really is how much of that mobility is influenced by the tax that they pay. And what we find is that tax is really not a major factor, even for this group, which as I've said, are kind of by construction, people who already have plausible ties abroad, they have kind of outside options, if you like, uh, and they have a lot of wealth and are potentially paying a lot of extra tax um, as a result of these reforms. Only an extra 0.2% left as a result of those reforms. Now you might say, okay, well, sure, but I've just told you about a loophole that was available to this group. So maybe they didn't leave just because they all used that loophole. Uh, in the paper, we can show actually, not everyone did make use of it. And, and on the whole, a lot of people did pay substantially more tax after the reform, but also, and quite usefully for us, we we're able to look at a subset of non-DOMs who, again, for, for quirks of the way that the reform 
was implemented don't have access to that special loophole. And we find even amongst that group who really did actually pay tax in full like everybody else um, as, as British uh, residents, um, their emigration rate as a result of the reform was very low as well. So we can, through this research, you know, um, question this um, common perception that people who are very rich are in the UK for low taxes and that if we tax them more, um, they will leave. So that being so, how much, how much money is at stake here? Well, we estimate that abolishing the non-DOM regime entirely, um, and that's with no loopholes, would raise around £3.2 billion pounds per year. Uh, that's a central estimate using fairly conservative assumptions and data from 2018, which means it would just up rating that would be slightly higher um, today. There is quite a lot of uncertainty around that figure, obviously we should acknowledge, and the reason for that uncertainty is mainly because as well as not having to pay tax on this income and gains currently, HMRC doesn't require or the government doesn't require that those individuals report the amount of those uh, income and gains at all. So in the study, we're trying to estimate um, that missing income um, through a, essentially a comparison with similar looking UK DOMs who are not able to benefit from this um, regime. Um, and the estimate accounts for those worries that you might have about people leaving. It also accounts for the other tax avoiding strategies that these individuals could and probably would adopt if they became taxed on the basis um, as everyone else. Um, so we think that it's 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 obviously an imperfect estimate. We can't be sure, but it's the best estimate that we would say anyone has. Uh, in fact, the government admitted recently that it, that the Treasury hasn't got its own estimate. They haven't done um, this, <clears throat> haven't made any attempt yet um, to figure out um, the cost of the non-DOM policy, although they are apparently doing that um, now. Uh, so this is an area in which, um, going back to this question of, is it possible to tax the super rich? Well, well, yes, I think it is, but only if um, we take account of some of these regimes, which are not, apart from when high profile individuals hit the headlines, are not um, sort of ones that most people spend their time thinking about. It's not, in this case, something like the top rate of income tax or one of those high profile uh, areas of the tax system, but by thinking carefully about the um, the weak points, as I said, in the current tax system, uh, I think it is possible um, to tax the super rich more. Thanks very much, Andy. I, I don't think my microphone is on, so I'm just going to shout just to briefly reintroduce the Honourable James Murray, who joined us because I did that before he arrived. But now that he's here, he's the Labour and Cooperative MP for Ealing North, and as I said, the Shadow Financial Secretary to the Treasury. Very happy to have you. So the floor is yours for about 10 minutes or so for your remarks. Great, thank you. Well, firstly, thank you so much for inviting me um, along here this evening. Um, the life of an MP is quite a varied one. Um, this morning, I started my day uh, in a primary school uh, in Greenford in my constituency uh, talking about Bakayo Saka, um, who is uh, a Greenford boy who's now doing very well uh, in the England team. Um, and the final question was, so where are you going to be at seven o'clock tonight uh, when the game starts? And I said, very honestly, I'm going to be at a, at a tax seminar at LSE. <laughs> and the interviewer sort of said, I think that was the wrong answer, James. That's definitely the right answer. It's a great place to be. Uh, but it, it sort of it underlines how varied the life of an MP um, can be. And actually this week, uh, my life as an MP has been dominated uh, by the finance bill, uh, which is going... Uh, through Parliament. It's going through particularly quickly. Normally finance bills at the second reading, various committee stages, report stage, third reading, and it drags out over several weeks and months. Uh, but this 
time. It's going through all in a matter of three days because uh, we had the uh, second reading yesterday and we've got all of the remaining stages tomorrow. So I feel that this is a very uh, timely uh, moment for me to come and talk to you about tax policy and being literally uh, in the middle uh, of a finance bill uh, this week. And actually, the debate around that finance bill, I think, frames um, our response uh, as the as the opposition to a lot of the questions uh, which have come up tonight. Um, and I'll just touch on a few uh, things which have come up very strongly in the debate we had yesterday about the finance bill, um, and indeed the debate we had in Parliament after the autumn statement, uh, which is the uh, fiscal event from which the finance bill uh, derives. Um, and the first one, just to set a bit of context, it's slightly a broader uh, broader view than what we're talking about today, but I think it's an important one, um, which is about the role of global factors um, on this on the situation that we're in um, in the UK. Um, and one of the arguments uh, which the government uh, puts forward when they're setting out their reasons behind their decisions in the autumn statement, uh, their decisions in the in the finance bill, uh, their explanation of why we're in a situation uh, that we're in, uh, is to point to global factors. Uh, for uh, creating the situation that the UK economy is currently in. Um, and what we say back to them is, well, of course, no one is denying global factors. Uh, no one is denying uh, the very deep impact that COVID had, has had, continues to have, and obviously the impacts uh, of Putin's invasion of Ukraine. Uh, but to assume that the UK's financial and economic situation is entirely the result of global factors totally outside of the control of the UK government, I think is not credible. And frankly, it's insulting uh, to suggest that the government of the last 12 years, and in particular the last 12 weeks, um, had nothing to do with the situation um, that we're in. Um, and I think if you, it's important to see that wider context because the financial and economic situation in the UK is one that has been uh, defined over the last 12 years uh, by uh, low growth. Uh, in comparison to OECD countries. And forgive me, I didn't see all of the presentation when I came in, but I think we were starting to talk a bit about the low growth rate in the UK, which is pivotal uh, to the economic reality um, that we face. You know, our economic growth over the last 12 years in the UK has been a third lower than the OECD average. Um, if that economic growth had been uh, the same as the OECD average over the last 12 years, an average household would be £10,000 better off now uh, if we'd had that growth over the last 12 years. So it really does have an impact on people's lives, and particularly when we're facing the cost of living crisis, uh, to be coming into it with that very different level of growth uh, behind us would make a huge difference uh, to people's lives. If you look at the growth that we're facing right now as well, the, the story is not really any better, uh, because we're now the only G7 economy, uh, which is still smaller now um, than we were before COVID. Uh, and that sets us aside from the other uh, G7 economies. And if you look going forward uh, over the next two years, what are our growth uh, prospects? Well, uh, we're at the bottom of the OECD countries for our growth rate, with one exception, uh, which is Russia. Um, otherwise, we're at the bottom of that league. So I think that story of low growth, that conclusion uh, that we have low growth in this country is really central to conversations about tax, about public investment, uh, and about how we grow the economy um, in the future. So with that context, the finance bill has then come forward this week based on the autumn statement, um, and a lot of the choices have been around taxation. Um, and our criticism um, of the government uh, this week um, is that the taxes which they are uh, raising through the finance bill um, are in large part stealth taxes um, on working people. Um, and why do we call them stealth taxes? Well, one of the main ways in which they're raising taxes is by extending the freeze um, in the personal allowance threshold uh, through to 2028. So that means the uh, 12 and a half thousand odd pounds that people get tax free, their personal allowance uh, is now going to be frozen in real in nominal terms uh, until 2028, which will start to bite into people's income. And the average earner uh, will see a fall uh, in their income because of the increase in taxes of around 500 pounds um, as a result of that stealth tax, as a result um, of that freeze. You know, alongside that stealth tax on income tax, there's also an increase in council tax, which was announced um, in the autumn statement. And we all know how that uh, impacts people across the board. So we're critical of the government for having taken those decisions, for having chosen uh, to raise taxes in those ways when there are other options uh, staring them in the face. Um, and just to give a few examples of the other options that we believe uh, would be fairer. Uh, number one, the windfall tax. Now, the windfall tax has had 
uh, to put it mildly, a painful journey through Parliament. Uh, we first called for it back in January. Uh, the government had been reluctant uh, to bring it forward. Uh, but we're now in a position where we have a windfall tax on the statute books, um, but it has a large investment allowance associated with it, whereby uh, oil and gas giants uh, can claim back uh, some of their tax liability and avoid paying uh, some of the windfall tax. And this means that some of the big oil and gas giants um, have paid no windfall tax at all um, this year uh, because of this uh, tax loophole through which they can uh, claim it back. Uh, you know, we think that's wrong. Uh, we think these investment allowances, which are targeted uh, directly at the oil and gas giants' investment in oil and gas uh, infrastructure, um, are not the right thing to do. And if you got rid of that investment allowance, uh, you could raise around £8 billion um, over the next five years. And there are other examples, such as the uh, private equity uh, loophole, uh, whereby private equity fund managers pay a lower rate of tax on their bonuses than they do um, on income. That just seems simply unfair. Um, and then, of course, there's the non-DOM tax status, which um, I think is really, I think it really offends people's sense of fairness um, in the tax system. Uh, you know, as, as we just heard, it's not one of those tax rates that people uh, used to talk about um, as much as some of the other more popular tax rates which discussed in the media. But when people realize what non-DOM uh, tax status is um, and the effect that it has, um, I think people are really offended by the unfairness um, that, that, it, 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 uh, that it encapsulates. And from our point of view, you know, we think it's a no-brainer. You know, we think getting rid of non-DOM tax status, you know, having a modern system of temporary residence akin to they have what they have in other countries like France, Germany, Canada, and so on, uh, is, is a way to modernize our tax system in a way that really should be something uh, which everyone agrees with. And, uh, you know, as, as Andy said, uh, £3.2 billion pounds, um, is, a, is the number which LSE and, and Warwick have worked on together. I mean, it really shows we're talking about serious amounts of money here, uh, which I think makes it all the more galling when those tax, choice, tax choices are to raise taxes um, on working people. And then finally, the third bit of the, uh, the finance bill in the autumn statement, which we're dealing with this week, uh, comes full circle back to this question of growth. Um, I don't think we saw a plan for growth in the autumn statement. You know, when we had the 45-day government uh, of Liz Truss, uh, we saw what uh, she and her chancellor claimed as a plan for growth. Um, it didn't work, to put it bluntly. It damaged the economy. It caused a huge amount of uh, negative impact for people across the country. All of those ideas uh, got jettisoned pretty much, uh, but now what's left? And you know, this is not just me saying this as an opposition politician. This is what the CBI is saying. This is what other industry leaders are saying. There is no uh, plan for growth to get our economy um, growing. And I think that is so essential uh, to making sure we can get out of this doom loop uh, that we're in, in in the UK economy, a doom loop whereby we have higher taxes, lower wages, lower investment, or poorer public services, all of which doubles back and keeps growth down um, in the long run. We need to break out of that doom loop. You know, the former chancellor referred to it as a vicious cycle of stagnation. Uh, you know, that's one thing I agree with him on. Uh, that was a good description uh, of the situation that we're in. Uh, and that's what we need to get out of. And that's why so much of my time and my colleagues' time in the Shadow Treasury team is spent on setting out our plan um, for growth, you know, whether that's performing uh, business rates to make sure there's a level playing field, whether that's helping a uh, startup businesses across the UK, whether it's fixing the holes in the Brexit deal, or whether it's crucially investing in our green prosperity plan, which is investing that money now to make the transition in terms of our economy and our society from where we are now to where we need to be to tackle the climate emergency. And I think what's so important about investment um, in the green industries of the future, uh, in investment in insulation, investment in clean power uh, resources, um, is that it's not just essential to tackle the climate emergency, but it also helps grow the economy. You know, and, and Keir Starmer said recently, you know, some people have said in, in years gone by, is there a tension uh, between meeting the climate emergency and economic growth is the retention between those two objectives. And actually, what this shows um, is that they can work hand in hand. Because if you invest um, in new renewable energy sources, if you invest in insulating the 19 million homes across the UK that need insulation, if you invest in electrical vehicle charging infrastructure and so on, that tackles the climate emergency and it grows the economy. And I think ultimately, the way to get a fairer tax system, as well as getting rid of non-DOM status and doing some of the other changes I've mentioned, is to grow the economy, because that is the way to make sure we have a sustainable economy with decent wages across the country uh, and revenue that can, we can invest in public services.
So I'm going to finish there. I'm going to, if you want to hear uh, similar comments to this, you can tune into Parliament Channel tomorrow uh, afternoon <laughs> <laughs> um, as I complete the stages of the finance bill. Uh, but just to conclude by thanking you again very much for inviting me today. It's really great. I think I've met Andy on Zoom uh, many a time, uh, but it's very nice to hear him talking with such uh, eloquence about non uh, tax status in person. Um, and really lovely to meet all of you this evening. So thank you very much. Thanks, thanks very much, uh, Mr. Murray, um, and and thank all four of you for your for your interventions. Is this thing on now? Can you hear me? It says it's on. Thank okay, you. great. Thank you very much. So so we now have some time for Q and A. It's also a panel discussion, so hopefully we'll have you all interacting with with uh, one another. But but let me start with some questions. We do have some questions online coming in, and I'm going to get to those in a moment, but let me first see if there are uh, two or three questions that we can group here in the room. So let's start with these three, this two here, and uh, Andres at the back, please. Okay, thank you all. <clears throat> um, I have to say that I've been quite perplexed by what I've heard today. There've been so many gaps, actually. Um, I mean, a lot of the focus seems to have been on individual taxation. Whereas you know corporate taxation or you know, taxation of corporate corporations was really barely touched at all. Similarly, tax avoidance, tax evasion, um, progressive wealth, progressive um, capital gains, progressive inheritance, lots of gaps. It's just quite surprising. Uh, so I just wanted to you know, hear you guys address that or some of those anyway. Um, I guess my question actually follows up on, you know, the previous question. Um, I mean, we've been using, you know, the terminology of taxing the wealth, taxing the rich, like as a bit like a coinage of like what we want to tax the people who is most likely to um, derive all these tax revenues from. Um, I guess my question is essentially like, who are those rich? Are these individuals? Are these corporates? Are these, you know, other legal entities? Because like from a tax perspective, like trusts, partnerships, different PE houses. I mean, how could we ensure there's also a cross border justice across those like different person, um, different legal persons? Um, and the other question I suppose is um, related to um, international competition, um, something to do with like the non-domicile debates, like individual super rich individuals, they have better capacity of moving um, both their assets like across the world um, and also themselves traveling across um, you know across the world to manage their residence positions um, and their tax treatment in the most favorable ways um, whereas for you know individuals earning like quite single single like source of income it's much harder to do to achieve um, such resources um, and also, I think similarly for corporations where an, a local business want to expand internationally, there is, you know, a massive board of considerations, both in relation to, um, people, you know, taxation on their in, uh, employees, like directors, as well as corporation considerations. Those seems to be quite um, disproportionate when you consider, you know, a business simply want to expand on these sides. So I would like to hear your thoughts about, you know, those, um, how to cross the dichotomy of like personal and, you know, corporate tax, basically. Thanks. Thanks very much. Uh, Professor Velasco back there. Thanks very much. And congratulations to Andy and to everybody for a really good issue of the um, LSE Public Policy Review. I have a very simple question to Andy. Um, and let me say before I ask the question that I think the non-DOM regime is absolutely insane, you know, and if it were up to me, I would abolish it tomorrow. However, I am struck by how small your numbers are. I, you know, thanks to Google, I just checked uh, in the World Bank website what UK GDP is, and it's about 3.2 trillion. So if my math is right, your abolition of the non-DOM um, tax status would collect less than one-tenth of one percent of GDP. Um, and that's peanuts. I mean, 2.3 billion sounds like a lot of money, but if you put it as a share of GDP, it's less than one-tenth of one percent. So my broader question is, 
the fashion recently in many countries, including this one, has been to focus on the taxation of the super rich, which for political reasons, even if you want for ethical reasons, may be really good. But I worry that we may be barking up the wrong tree in the sense that we may get that done and the fiscal problem of a country like the UK will remain just as large because the amounts are absolutely tiny. So in a way, fixing the, the fiscal problems of many countries, including this one, takes us back to the old problem of not simply taxing a few, you know, the super rich people who are mobile, people who have fortunes elsewhere, but the middle class. And taxing the middle class is, of course, what no politicians would like to do. Um, so are we really solving the problem, Andy, or are we just going after a sort of an ever-moving target, which is politically sexy, but fiscally not particularly useful? Thanks. Thanks very much, Andres. Um, I had a similar thought to yours and asked Dandy here what the total tax take in the UK is. The numbers may not match exactly depending on the tax rate, but the, 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 the number he put up, the 3.2 billion, would be roughly 0.5 of 1%. Since the tax take is a little higher than 20%, it, there must be a little margin there, but that's that's the order of, of magnitude that we're talking about. Okay, so maybe you got, we, we can take those three first and then we'll go back online. Let me take a moment to encourage our online audience to add questions. We have one, but if other people wanna add their brief questions, please go ahead. And if you do that, please add your affiliation and your name if you don't mind. We'll go in reverse order of my LSE colleagues. So Andy, Jonathan, Kate, and then we'll, we have the last word, uh, Shane. Thanks. Uh, great. So, uh, it's firstly on on gaps that you pointed out. So, perhaps we, we should have explained the um, context for this event. It's to launch a um, special issue of the um, LSE Public Policy Review, which contains uh, lots of articles. The, these. Uh, we didn't have time to do 12 presentations, but just, just to let you know, for those, those of you who are interested in, in reading other um, articles in the review, there's, um, there's an article on um, offshore tax evasion um, by Daniel Reck and John Bomar. Uh, there is a, um, is, the, is the OECD's 2021 tax deal on um, taxing multinational corporations fair? That's uh, Riding and Verhoof. Um, there's issues of fairness in taxing corporate profit. So the, the the gaps that you identified are covered in the special issue, but admittedly not um, in, in the, the selection of um, papers that we're presenting today. I mean, I'm, I'm happy to speak to some of those um, specific issues if, if other people have um, questions on them. Um, so just on this um, point, about um and second of all i think was um different legal entities and their tax status so we have focused on um individuals here ultimately all taxes are borne by individuals so the right question to ask even in relation to corporations is what's the incidence of the tax on individuals and obviously there's some debate about that and variation across um, forms of company whether it whether the corporation tax is actually borne by the shareholders or whether it's borne to some extent by others in the supply chain consumers workers and so on that's a difficult empirical question but an important one to ask when you're thinking about um, corporation tax policy. Same question with trusts. I mean, one of the great difficulties with trusts as a legal entity is that you have the sort of split of your conventional concept of ownership, where there's just one owner into settlers and beneficiaries and thinking about how you should tax trusts, given that is a, is a hard question. But definitely, those are all really important questions and opportunities for um, avoidance in particular within the um, system. Um, but I think it's right in the end to focus on the impact of tax on individuals because they're the kind of humans that uh, whose welfare matters, if you like. Um, on Andres's question about um, is this a kind of drop in the ocean? Um, well, we actually in other work have a tax simulator that lets you look at the impact of making reforms, not only to the non-DOM status, but to other taxes on the uh, wealthy. So that includes things like changes to capital gains tax, um, reforms to inheritance tax, um, national insurance contributions on investment 
income and um, that's kind of work in progress at the moment i wouldn't want to sort of stake too much on on the the totals that we get from that but but as an order of magnitude putting sort of all of those reforms together we're more like in the region of 50 to 70 billion of potential tax revenue from reforms to taxes on the rich so to speak still that's you know that's that uh, that would make a larger dent in um, in, in current debates about public finances, but it's still not huge in the context of the total UK tax take. Um, but I don't think that these are kind of antagonistic objectives. Actually, I think taxing the, the super rich fairly is a kind of prerequisite to raising um, taxes on other groups because people will reasonably um, resist the, this this idea that I started with in my presentation that somehow the super rich don't end up paying the taxes that they have to pay. Thanks. I, I did forget to ask you all to be very brief. In <laughs> but this was excellent. <laughs> right. So I have no particular expertise on taxation of capital on corporate tax or taxation of wealth. Um, my, my instinct is that actually I, I, I agree there must be ways of taxing wealth more, taxing capital gains more, taxing corporations more. We all know there are all kinds of ways in which multinational corporations, wealthy individuals can, can um, uh, play tax jurisdictions off, off each other and, and, and avoid tax altogether. I don't think dealing with that is going to solve all of our problems, frankly. I think it's far too easy to make a pitch that we can solve all our problems by um, you know, making a handful of people who are exorbitantly rewarded pay a bit more. Because even though it is true that there's, you know, there is an increasing concentration of income at the top, um, and 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 this is in something that we have to address, but gaps of around 10% of GDP between our tax revenue and those of, you know, better resourced welfare states in, in, in Northern Europe are not going to be closed just by uh, taxing the wealthy. Um, and, you know, the median earner in, in the UK faces an income tax rate of 20%, which is extremely low by international standards. Um, there are other ways in which, um, you know, av average incomes could be, could be taxed as well. There's no property tax in the UK, which is even the United States has quite a hefty property tax, which, um, which you know, is a tax levied on the value of your asset that you live in, right? Which is something which in Britain simply doesn't exist. We have council tax, but every, everybody pays that whether or not you actually own the, the place you're, you're living in. So I think if you look at successful social democracies over you know, the last half a century, they are countries which have taxed all of their population um, um, reasonably heavily in order to pay for the um, public goods and, and uh, social protection that benefit the vast majority of the population. So I agree we need to really work very hard to try and get the wealthy to pay more, but I don't think we should elude ourselves that that, that is going to solve all of our problems. Because apart from the fact that these people are very powerful, if they've avoided taxes up to now, there's a good reason, right? They are hard to deal with. They have political resources they can mobilize. Uh, but also because, you know, um, middle class people also have resources. They have their votes, right? And their votes have been increasingly, you know, powerful in resisting attempts to raise the tax burden on them, which leads us with this, I think, a situation we have in Britain where there's an impasse. We we all know that more money needs to be spent on the NHS, that it's literally falling apart. We can all see it. Um, but nobody can agree, agree on who is to pay. And I think, well, I could elaborate more on some of the reasons why our politics plays out that way, but we are stuck and the, there's no way getting out of this without addressing the, the greater level of tax that most of us ought to be paying. Thanks. Um, yeah, speaking briefly to the two questions at the front, and I think Andy makes the point that there's other articles in the issue kind of dealing with different sorts of taxation, including like corporate and not focused on the individual. But I think linked to that going back to what I was saying, I think that tells us something about the state of kind of the sort of work I do is trying to understand public discourse and the way the public talk about these things. And it's notably lacking, right, that tax is really synonymous with what's happening at the household level and the individual level. It's not really thought of as being like Jonathan's anecdote. It's not about what shopkeepers are doing or kind of whether you can use contactless payment and things. That's not what the kind of debate is about. And so maybe points to where some of the sort of um, the political kind of uh, 
landscape where it lies and where you need, maybe need to expand it into to kind of open up more of a kind of public discussion about what that should look like and kind of to talk more politically about these things. And I think related to then the question of sort of who are the rich and who are we talking about? I think the work I'm familiar with, there's the two main things. One is who are the rich? Not, not me, wherever I actually am on the income distribution. And so it was, it's notable, like, for example, if you put um, people in a focus group together who are themselves actually from across the income and wealth distributions, what you'll see playing out in the group is that people are signaling in various ways how they're the ordinary middle and kind of people positioning like that, which again tells us something about kind of political acceptability of some of the sorts of taxes we're talking about if you will see yourselves as in the middle. So I guess just to kind of say briefly then, I think the challenge for some of the things that need to be on the table then are about a sort of change at the level of how these policy options are talked about and framed and that's and not to underestimate the scale of that challenge and I think I'd, I'd go back to in a country like the UK um, so we talked about the kind of legacy of 2010 onwards of the challenge of low growth but there's also as I was saying at the end of the presentation that I gave the challenge of the legacy of austerity and ongoing austerity that I think that creates an environment where private insurance against different sorts of risks in life become the kind of most viable option if you're kind of somewhere in the middle or towards the top of the income and wealth distribution so breaking that and kind of trusting that you would pay more tax because the state will look after you if you're sick or unemployed or um or older um at the moment that's more perceived as a risk in a country like the uk and, and people think well i'd rather do that for myself privately and so yeah not to underestimate the sort of um yeah discourse change that's needed to to engage with that yeah i think there was a really interesting point from the two uh audience members in the front row about uh you know corporations or companies and so on paying uh, their fair share as part of a fairer tax system um and it just made me think of two two obvious examples uh where uh, that that should be the case you know one being the windfall tax which which i mentioned which you know has been I mean, one of our central aims this year is to try and get a strong, effective windfall tax um, on the statute books. Um, and I think that's a good example where, you know, individuals, households are struggling with home energy bills. They can see them rising. Um, at this, the the uh, what is causing those energy bills to go up is also landing uh, huge super profits uh, for you know excess profits for large oil and gas giants. Um, it's just a. It seems to me to be a, a basic matter of fairness. Uh, that a windfall tax is an appropriate way uh, to tax some of those excess profits and, and make sure you can help people, including by keeping their energy bills um, down. So that's one example there. And the other example, I think Andy touched on it in uh, one of the other uh, chapters in the in the publication, uh, but it's about uh, the global nature um, of corporation tax. Um, and you know, the OECD uh, struck a, a deal about having a global minimum corporate rate of tax. Um, you've obviously got pillar one and pillar two of that deal. Pillar two, uh, the government has said in the UK they will now implement uh, in in the spring. Uh, you know we want to see that happen. Uh, we, you know, we won't believe it till it's on the statute book, uh, and we also want to make sure that other countries do it as well because it is much more effective if other countries uh, do it. And that's where we need to show international leadership uh, to make sure that other countries um, follow suit. So, you know, I I, th I think I do see a fair tax system as being broader than. The, the topics we've spoken about today as important um, as, as they are. Uh, it's part of a, an overall fair tax system where people are paying their fair share, um, but also people are confident that everyone else is um, because there is that need to have trust in a tax system. Um, and that's my sort of, I know it's a very political point, but it's an important one, which is that if people are being asked to pay more income tax uh, and so on through the, the freeze of thresholds, if they don't think other people are paying their fair share, whether that's the oil and gas giants, whether that's international corporations, whether that's uh, non-DOMs, um, it, it undermines trust in the tax system um, overall. Um, and then just to uh, the gentleman in the back row, um, his points, I mean, you know, 3.2 billion, um, I don't mean to sound churlish, but it's not to be sniffed at, you know, and, and we, we've set out our plan how we would spend uh, some of that on a NHS workforce expansion plan, um, you know, because we believe you know, as the opposition, it is essential that every 
uh, pledge that we make, every commitment we make shows how we would fund improvements to public services, what we would, you know, how we'd raise the money, how much it would cost and so on. Uh, but there's an example of where that 3.2 billion pounds, uh, some of that money could be spent making a real difference to the NHS, uh, which is at the forefront um, of so many of our minds. Um, and I think more broadly, you know, the question you asked, I think about, I guess it's sort of touching the fairness um, of the tax system overall. You know, I think one of the issues we have with the tax system in, in the in the UK uh, is that uh, it has become unfair, not just with the, with with all the loopholes that we've we've discussed today, um, but also if you look at the debate over the the national insurance increase last year, you know, which was connected to the health and social care levy, uh, there was a decision there to raise taxes on work rather than other sources of income. You know, and I think that's a really important distinction because rather than looking at, let's say, uh, the income people make from renting out multiple properties or trading stocks and shares and so on, it's work uh, that is being taxed and that creates an imbalance and an unfairness in the system too. Great, thank you very much. Um, so we now have three questions online, which would make for nice symmetry. I will read those. Then I will open up again to see if there's any one or two final questions here. That means there'll be lots of questions and very little time. <laughs> so you may pick a question, um, pay attention, choose your own, um, or you may try to answer all of them, but you'll have two minutes each. <laughs> and uh, we'll go in the in the order from the left to the right where I'm sitting. So, okay. So, okay. so from Steve Ball Ballard or Ballard, who is the secretary of the London Hazard Center, he asks, does this mean does this mean that neither the Labour Party nor the LSE feels the need to address what Beveridge identified as the five giants on the road to reconstruction, namely want, disease, ignorance, squalor, and idleness? What is the chimera of growth? I'm told that's how you pronounce that word in English. <laughs> I know how to pronounce it in Portuguese. <laughs> uh, okay, is that, oh no, don't go away. That was one. Next, a very nice question from Etienne Skozinet, who is a sixth form student from Battersea. That's a simple question. Is there any certain time when this tax policy change should, I guess, should, should not take place, i.e. non-DOM status should not be abolished during the recession, for example? Basically, are the economic cycle and current situation in the economy needed to be taken into account when making changes to non-DOM status? And then from Michael Joff, who is at Imperial College uh, and an LSE alumnus, lives in London, says, I appreciate that property taxation may be a problematic framing for many people, but how about making council tax into progressive tax? It has always been highly regressive, but could be reformed. Admittedly, it would be a major undertaking, but... I think that's it, but dot, dot, dot. Uh, I don't think there's any more there so th those are the three uh any final and very short question here Somewhere in the front. are you thinking the hello mm -hmm. yeah so i just have one question rethinking how we use the tax system obviously we need to tax the rich a little bit more but as a young working person i think a key issue is freeing up more land for housing, um, raising salaries in line with inflation. Can't we find a way to incentivize using the tax system to incentivize the rich to move towards these sort of more progressive goals, like creating tax credits, you know, just to get the rich to raise salaries, um, to free up equity that they hold in land, in cash, so on and so forth. So that's how I would think. And also for companies, you know, they keep selling people lots of consumer goods, um, perhaps junk food. Can we just incentivize these companies to move away from all these things that put a burden on the NHS to reduce the um, burden on taxes? Yeah. Thank you very much. So we actually have one minute, 15 seconds each, but I might let it run to <laughs> the beginning of you. Uh, okay, thank you. Um, I think I'll, I'll take an interpretation of the first question, if that's okay. And um, so not speaking on behalf of the LSE, but um, 
question of whether we need to tackle beverages five giants and I, I think use that as a chance to say something briefly about um attitudinal shift and so if we understand the beverage report and the kind of post-war consensus is relying on the rupture of the second world war and what that did for social norms and social attitudes and I think um, something to sort of note and something that's quite striking is that the, pan the COVID-19 pandemic kind of you saw lots of commentary of that being another complete upheaval and potentially a real chance to remake the rules of society in various ways and work I've been involved in and then also thinking about uh, survey attitude research I'm familiar with it's really been remarkable how stable attitudes have been towards things like the welfare state and aspects of taxation so in the UK context my reading would be that you see a sort of longer run actually kind of softening of attitudes and increased support for some of the sorts of things we've been talking about today but that we haven't seen some sort of huge kind of rupture pandemic effect um, and I would guess that the current cost of living crisis is maybe also going to be actually quite surprisingly stable in terms of what we see to attitudes despite kind of how huge kind of the kind of the current political context is um and that kind of feeds into the discussions we've been having this evening yeah quickly i, I think i'd pick up the point about um freeing up land for housing and, and thinking about council tax because both of those are connected to one thing we haven't really talked about today which is increasingly important the political economy of rich countries which is housing and housing wealth right and, and what we do about housing wealth uh how it's treated in the tax system i mentioned property taxes before and th there are multiple veto points multiple blocks to do anything about this and, and they they operate at different levels on one level you have big big landowners who have these land banks that they release you know as slowly as possible to keep house prices high and and these are very concentrated very very rich corporations uh who have the ability to to shape the market and they are left free to be able to manipulate uh land prices in a way which suits them we should do something about that that's a a, a free hit right the reason we don't do it is because clearly these people have you know they own newspapers, they have a lot of money, they donate to political parties, and they're able to effectively corrupt the political system. Um, but this is something that we have to have the courage to go at. And I think dealing with political institutions, the inability of British governments really to, to act in the interests of voters rather than the interests of sort of small numbers of very powerful, uh, wealthy people who have these kind of hidden vetoes on, on political decisions. This is something that I really hope the next government uh, gets to grips with. And I know it's not easy, but you know, at some point we have to face down um, these 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 veto players. But just one quick point on council tax: the last time somebody tried to fiddle with the council tax system, it led to riots in Trafalgar Square and the fall of the the Thatcher government. And these these are and this is not about wealthy interests. This is about Middle England, right? It's about homeowners. It's about people who have effectively blocked uh, the revaluation of housing of the housing prices registered that 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 established the council tax bans for 30 years which is very good for me because my house used to be very cheap and so <laughs> i pay very little council council tax but you know we we need to address this there's no way of actually dealing with a tax fairness if we don't actually deal with those middle class veto points as well and this is the really tricky thing when you're trying to get elected but you know there's no way around it it needs to be done sure. Andy? Uh, so <clears throat> I can take this uh, question about uh, whether we should wait until after the recession to abolish non-DOM status. Uh, I think the short answer to that would be no. Um, government could and I think should um, do it now. Uh, there's, a, there's a reasonable question about whether we should have some kind of regime that's seeking to um, attract investment and talented people to the UK. But the really important point, which I didn't mention in the presentation, is that the non-DOM regime is a terrible regime for achieving either of those objectives. Uh, essentially, to get the benefit of non-DOM status, you have to convincingly t tell the tax authority that you're planning on leaving again. So as a way of attracting people to stay in the UK, it's not a suitable regime. Uh, and it's not a good way of attracting investment to the UK. In fact, it does precisely the opposite, because the way that you get the benefit of non-DOM status is by making sure you keep all of your assets outside of the UK. So there may be some case for having some kind of replacement um, regime, but should we abolish the non-DOM regime as it is? I think absolutely yes now. Thank you. And you have the last word, Mr. 
I think um, a minute and 15 seconds is a very mean amount of time to give <laughs> for such good questions. Um, but if I can just focus on a few points that jump out at me that maybe I can add something to the discussion on. I mean, I think the, the question about council tax um, and about raising council tax, um, you know, in the autumn statement, as I, I may have mentioned, uh, the government is essentially uh, you know, putting a, a £100 council tax increase in the average bandy household because they are raising the cap and because councils have all been through so many budget cuts, they're all going to uh, take 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 that opportunity. Um, and, and, you know, councils are going to take that decision because they've had their budgets cut so much um, over the last uh, 10 or so years. I think the, the politics of it is really important as well, though, um, in that, you know, this is the government, the central government, essentially saying to local government, you do the tax rise, you know, you send the bill through to people. Um, so it's kind of, it's partly political, I think as well, you know, it's about rather than the government taking responsibility for saying, right, we need to raise taxes in this way and we're going to do it. It's saying, no, councils are going to do it. And then you get your bill from the council and it's, oh, my council tax has gone up. That's the council's decision. So there's quite a bit of politics involved in, in council tax as well. Um, I'm so tempted to talk about housing, but I don't think I could do it justice. Um, I Before I was an MP, I was a deputy mayor for housing, worked for Sadiq Khan. Um, so I could talk about it all day and night and for several weeks. So um, I won't even attempt to, I'm afraid, <laughs> except to say that we could have a whole seminar on, on that in itself. Um, and just to, to end really, um, I mean, again, the first question we had is not one that we can do justice to uh, in, in a few seconds, uh, but I think, you know, the big ill that is facing people across the country right now, um, the biggest ill in everyone's, the front of everyone's vision, alongside the many, many challenges we face, is the fact that living standards are going to drop by 7% over the next two years. You know, it's the biggest fall on record. We've got the biggest stagnation in wages in 150 years. You know, this is a really serious time for people's living standards across the country. And that's why making sure we have fairer taxes. That's why making sure we have growth is so critical uh, to people right across the UK. Thank you very much. Please, please join me in uh, thanking the four speaker. And, and just as a last word to remind you, as, as Andy did, that if you want to find out more, please please look up the issue, this, this issue of the LSD Public Policy Review online. And thank you all very much for coming and to the people online. And for missing the football. <laughs> <laughs>